On the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson asked Ed McMahon, what's it like to be half Catholic and half Jewish? Ed McMahon replied, you still have to go to confession, but at least you can bring your lawyer. <laughs> Sports Faith has a lawyer who is well versed in canon law, Bishop Paprocki. He will introduce Archbishop Cardellion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight. First of all, I want to thank Patrick McCaskey and his mother, Virginia, for all that they do to promote the Catholic faith and Catholic values. Thank you to the McCaskies. It is my honor to introduce to you tonight the recipient of the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Award. This award is named after Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who was the first, really, to make inroads into Catholic media on television. I remember when I was a young boy watching him on TV with his television program talking about our faith. And he was so successful in what he did was that he actually beat Milton Berle in the primetime ratings for his television program. Our honoree continues in that tradition of being someone who is outspoken and not afraid to talk about our faith. I don't have to read to you his biography that's in your program because I know it personally very well. Archbishop Cordelioni and I have been friends for 35 years. In 1987, when I was a young priest, my archbishop sent me to Rome to study canon law. And when I arrived at the Casa Santa Maria, the graduate house of the Pontifical North American College, I met Sal, as I call him, and uh, welcomed me to Rome and helped me to get acclimated to the world of canon law. Archbishop Cordelioni is a priest of the Diocese of San Diego and he served there as uh, auxiliary bishop. Prior to becoming auxiliary bishop, though, he was an assistant at the Supreme uh, Tribunal of the Apostolic Signatura in Rome, this, basically the Supreme Court of the Catholic Church. Then became auxiliary bishop of San Diego. He was the bishop of Oakland, California uh, for four years, and for the last 10 years, he has served as the Archbishop of San Francisco. Archbishop Cordelioni made headlines earlier this year when he announced that because of her obstinate persistence in promoting the grave sin of abortion, Speaker Nancy Pelosi of the United States House of Representatives was not to receive Holy Communion. Unfortunately, she has not adhered to that directive in finding places to receive Holy Communion outside of the Archdiocese of San Francisco. But we should not think that a measure such as that is ineffective, even if it's flaunted from time to time. Here in Illinois, and Illinois, by the way, is very similar in many ways. The politics here are similar to the state of California in that we're a very pro-abortion state here. 
So in 2017 and 2019, we had very strong pro-abortion laws passed here that basically made abortion a fundamental right and said that uh, an unborn fetus has no independent rights of its own and also provided for taxpayer funding of abortion. After that second law was passed in 2019, I told Speaker of the House Michael Madigan and President of the Senate John Cullerton that they were not to receive Holy Communion. I don't know if there's a cause or effect, but God has his way of working in his own ways. Later that year, in November of 2019, uh, Mr. Cullerton announced that he was retiring from politics. Earlier this year, Speaker Madigan resigned as Speaker of the Illinois House of Representatives after being indicted. And just yesterday, Speaker Pelosi announced that she was stepping down as the leader of the Democratic Party in Congress. So perhaps there is a connection. We leave that all in God's hands. But I think the best way to introduce our honoree tonight is simply by calling to notice his name. His parents, I think, were very prophetic when they baptized him Salvatore Cordelione. Salvatore, of course, is Italian for Savior. So the Archbishop is named after our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And his last name, Cordelione, Cor di Leone, means the heart of a lion. So our honoree, <laughs> Our honoree very much follows in the footsteps as a successor of the apostles, follows in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and indeed has shown that he has the heart of a lion. Please welcome Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione. Thank you, Bishop Prockey, for that very flattering introduction. It's a special joy for me to be uh, introduced by you uh, with our long friendship and collaboration going back many years as graduate students in canon law and then as the whole time we've been together. We were made bishops, named bishops just within a few months of each other, and we've been close collaborators ever since as bishops, so it's, uh, thank you for that. Thank you very much for bestowing this award on me. Um, it has a special significance for me as Fulton Sheen has been um, a big inspiration for me. I, I must admit, kind of discovering him, I kind of a latecomer in discovering him. I didn't really become familiar with him until I was doing my philosophy studies in the college seminary. And uh, when I was introduced to his, his talks and his insights, and I just so much love hearing re replays of those talks. As you know, he was very, uh, had great foresight. They're so pertinent to what we're experiencing today, even though he's delivering those talks even 60 years ago. So I'm, I'm very honored um, to be with you and to receive this award. I would like to reflect with you tonight, though, on, uh, you know, the U.S. bishops were in this three-year Eucharistic revival uh, process uh, to rekindle uh, the Catholic faith in the real presence, as we know, we're alarmed at the decline in that core Catholic belief. It really is who we are. It's at the heart of our identity. But I would like to reflect in sort of a broader way of what this means, and really in the broadest sense of what our belief in the Eucharist and the Church's love for our Lord in the Eucharist as building of civilization. The Church has used, if you think about our, our Church's our liturgies, music, so much beautiful music, it's all built around reverence 
or the Holy Eucharist in the celebration of the Mass. The Church has used the Greek, three great transcendentals to do that, truth, beauty, and goodness. And with those three transcendentals, uh, built a Christian civilization. Each one is really a doorway to God who is the perfection of each. And we need to tap into all three of those because some will connect with, one will connect with some, another will connect with others, and so forth. We need to use all, all three. So I would like to reflect on these, but especially, not exclusively, but to dwell a little bit more on the transcendental of beauty. For we are facing challenges with the other two, truth and goodness. We're facing challenges to um, uh, the very concepts of truth and of goodness. Indeed, we live in an age that contests what is good. And uh, the Bishop Paprocki appropriately brought up the abortion debate. We're so grateful for the Supreme Court Dobbs decision that does not take away rights, has actually restored a right. <laughs> restored a right to the people to decide what the lo abortion laws will be in their state. That's already problematic, though, no, that people could even decide that they, it could be legal in their state, but at least the people can now decide that. Uh, and now it's gone beyond a choice. It's beyond as bad enough as they called it health care. It's now celebrated as a very good, very, as a good. And then with regard to truth, reason itself has become the subject of controversy. The Enlightenment believed in truth and its pursuit through reason. And while a sound principle, it is incomplete. For the Enlightenment privatized faith, relegating it to a matter of private opinion, rather than one of the sources with which to apprehend the truth. One of the great hallmarks of the Catholic intellectual tradition, of course, is the understanding that faith and reason must work together. Each makes its own unique contribution and serves as a necessary check on the other, because without one without the other can go off into an extreme. Working together, though, we can come to an understanding of the truth. Now, after centuries of a modern world trying to understand truth, on the basis of reason alone, what do we have now in the postmodern world? Neither faith nor reason is a source of truth. Rather, truth itself is privatized, a matter of private opinion, which I am entitled to live and which everyone else is obliged to respect. So in the quest for truth, the long arc of Western history has moved from faith and reason to reason alone and not faith and now to neither faith nor reason, but only the will to power. With beauty, though, it's different. While people may argue you have your truth and I have my truth, and may relativize even what is clearly good, there is no arguing when it comes to beauty. It touches people in an intuitive way, circumventing logical arguments, or in this day and age, more often we should say illogic. <laughs> it's mostly illogical, but it circumvents that whole argumentative dimension and s touches us in an intuitive way and so can prepare the soil of the soul for sowing the seeds of truth. And while people may intentionally turn a blind eye to all the good the church does for the world, beauty cannot be denied when it's in front of you. For example, I'm sure you all remember this, I still remain struck at how the whole world, regardless of faith affiliation or lack thereof, mourned the destruction of the great edifice to the glory and majesty of God that is the Cathedral of Notre Dame to Paris. So I'm sure you all remember as well as I do how the whole world, Catholics and non-Catholics alike, looked on shocked and appalled as flames threatened to destroy sacred beauty. It was an uncanny moment of unity and suffering, suffering together the potential loss of an ancient beauty, the soaring beauty of that great cathedral, which meant so much to so many over so many centuries, again, Catholics and non-Catholics alike. It was one of those moments of solidarity in which the sentiment was, we are all French. For truly, Notre Dame is the physical expression of all that is great in French culture and legacy and even to this day is the mother of every French person, even as secularized as that country has become. 
The world's response to this great tragedy shows that the language of beauty, especially classical beauty, continues to touch hearts in our troubled, divisive, anxious, and uncertain time. It does so because what is classical attains that status because it has withstood the test of time. It is universal, beautiful in every age and in every culture. There is something, again, intuitive about that, which is not subject to personal opinion or argumentation. It is, to a large extent, an untapped resource for reaching people, especially young people, with the gospel in this deconstructed age in which we live. The timelessness of sacred beauty gives it the power to lift us out of the world of time and give us a glimpse of that which transcends time, of what ultimately lasts, of what our goal and our final home is, ultimately the reality of God. A key to the path of renewal of both church and society then is to recapture the importance of beauty, to recognize its universality and its power to evangelize and open hearts to the truth. Such beauty as that which the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris offers to the world is a brief respite in the incessant deconstruction and violence to which our society is subject nowadays and which we all find terribly disconcerting, to put it mildly. The movements marked by these trends are often carried out by protagonists of what social commentators refer to as the cancel culture. This is now entered into our everyday lexicon. We are living in an age, yes, of cancel culture. We are all painfully aware of this. So I did a little surfing on the internet to look this up and came across uh, a definition of cancel culture in the online urban dictionary. So it defines cancel culture in this way. A modern internet phenomenon where a person is ejected from influence or fame by questionable actions. It is caused by a critical mass of people who are quick to judge and slow to question. It is commonly caused by an accusation whether that accusation has merit or not. It is a direct result of the ignorance of people caused by communication technologies outpacing the growth in available knowledge of a person. Now, if anyone thought that cancel culture was a new phenomenon with our time, such a one can stand corrected. The church reminds us of this every year on Good Friday. Was not our Lord ejected from influence because he posed a threat to the worldly power of the governing authorities and the leaders of his own people? Were not the people quick to judge without thinking things through, including even the scholars of the law who should have known better? Do we not see here a growing mob mentality that erupts in violence against an innocent man? This is the story on the human level. It is also the same story we are seeing played out before our eyes today. What do the cancelers really want to cancel out? It is far more than those who disagree with them. The real activists are seeking to discredit the great protagonists of Western civilization, both in the history of our country and of our church. How else can one explain the toppling of statues of such giants of our history as Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant? This happened elsewhere, but it happened in my own city of San Francisco. And along with them, the counselors on Rampage in Golden Gate Park also tore down the statue of St. Junipero Serra. As you may know, I've been engaged in a multi-year effort to defend his legacy and attain restitution for the second Serra statue that was pulled down. There was a second one which is on our parish property, uh, Mission San Rafael, another one of the 21 missions the Franciscans uh, started, uh, founded that he started. So we're seeking to defend his legacy. And the, I, as Bishop Paprocki said, I grew up in San Diego. I grew up about three and a half miles from the first mission that he founded. So for me, Junipero Serra was like an old neighbor. You know, it's just, just part of life. And, the more I come to learn about him, the more I, I'm amazed at what heroic virtue, virtue he had in defending the indigenous people. 
that they try to cancel this all out. We should not be naive. By trying to cancel out Western civilization, what the cancelers are really trying to cancel out is the church. So the way there for them is to cancel out truth, beauty, and goodness, the building blocks with which the church built a Christian world. They certainly have gone a long way in counseling out truth, as I mentioned before. Although we know, despite the relativists claim that you have your truth and I have my truth, the secular culture has its own infallible dogmas that it forces on the citizenry. It's their own gospel truth and it pretty severely punishes any dissenters from their gospel truth. Beauty, though, again, is a bit harder to cancel out, as witnessed again by the sadness of the entire world at the burning of the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris. Not to mention, if we think of all of the other great medieval cathedrals of Europe, to which people from all over the world come for almost, have come for almost a millennium to admire, and to this day are reduced to silence with their timeless beauty. The church's witness of her commitment to goodness may also be difficult to cancel out, but the promoters of what we call the black legend, all these legends and myths about our history, they've done a good job at perpetuating these myths, lies and distortions of the church's historical record. Uh, so much so that ignorance and hatred of the Catholic church now dominate the secular cultural mentality. So I mentioned Junipero Serra, he's one of very many examples we can give of how the history is so much different from the popular narrative. We need to tell our own stories then as Catholics because no one else would do that for us. We need to tell that story not only in history books but also using the arts, in art as in sense of painting, in literature, music, poetry, painting. The church has done this throughout her history through her institutions and her saints. All three, truth, beauty, goodness. So we can begin by considering what was originated as a bulwark of truth and reason, working together to mind, discover, and understand truth, the university. Let us recall that it was the Catholic Church that gave the world the university. The university was indeed born from the heart of the church, as the opening sentence of Pope St. John Paul II's landmark apostolic constitution on Catholic universities makes clear and from which it takes its name, Ex Corde Ecclesiae. He begins, born from the heart of the church, a Catholic university is located in that course of tradition which may be traced back to the very origin of the university as an institution. This is another chapter of our history we need to teach our people. So let's go way back. After the fall of the Roman Empire in the mid fifth century, so this was a total civilizational collapse. Who took over to keep the flame of faith and learning alive? It was the monasteries. Monasteries were not just places of refuge for prayer and contemplation. They were also centers of study, learning, and handing on knowledge. People moved with their families to be close to the monasteries so they could be educated. Villages began to develop around them. As I am fond of telling young people when I celebrate confirmation, a thousand years elapsed, elapsed between the fall of the Roman Empire, so the civilizational collapse, and the invention of the printing press. So I asked them, I say, I trust is preparing for confirmation you read the Bible. So you at least read the Bible. So have you ever thought about this? When you're holding a Bible in your hand, or any other ancient text for that matter, a Greek philosopher, a Roman poet, have you ever wondered how this text that is thousands of years old has found its way into your hands when civilization collapsed and for a thousand years there was no efficient way of printing texts on a massive scale? The answer is monasteries. For a thousand years, monks all across Europe spent their lives copying ancient texts. The monasteries even had a special room dedicated to this purpose called, logically, the scriptorium. It took advantage of the natural light. And because the church has always understood that truth, beauty, and goodness are interrelated, the monks turned these manuscripts into works of beauty, 
you know what they are. We call them illuminated manuscripts. So typical example, you know, the first letter on the page is a T and they turn that into a beautiful uh, artistic depiction of the crucifixion, the T becoming the cross. These are hundreds of years old and people to this day go to museums to admire them for their beauty. Then in the high middle ages, the church got the idea to pull all of the various branches of learning together into one place, all things. That word in Latin, all things, is universa. Thus was born the university. Of course, the church has been equally attentive to evangelizing through goodness, witnessed especially in how in her history she organized health care into hospitals, born from her constitutive commitment of service to the sick and the poor. Again, going back to the very beginning. As you may know, in ancient Rome, when a plague would break out, Anyone with the means would flee to the hills until the plague subsided and it was safe to return to the city. The Christians were the ones who famously stayed behind to care for the poor sick at great risk to their own health and even lives. And not just their own sick, but all the sick. This is just the Catholic ethos. I think about now very recently, but two, two and a half years ago now, when the COVID lockdowns just began. Everyone was sheltering in place. The city of San Francisco was trying to get homeless people into hotels, but they couldn't get them all in. There were still people living on the streets. The only ones still attending to them, delivering them food, providing the transportation they needed, were our Catholic Charities workers. Everyone has abandoned them. They and our school certainly did us proud at that time. But this witness of heroic virtue is what helped convert pagan Rome to being the center of the Christian faith. And once again, it was monasteries that stepped into the vacuum to provide health care after the collapse of the known civilization at the time. And here again, later in the Middle Ages, the church got the idea to put all the different branches of health care into one place, where all the sick could receive hospitality. Thus was born the hospital. Hospitals and the church's other such organized endeavors to serve the poor is service in the authentic Christian sense, not simply giving from what one has left over to help someone else less fortunate, but solidarity with the poor. This explains the flourishing of religious orders founded not only to serve the poor, but to actually be poor. Citizens with claims to wealth and nobility would divest themselves of such in order to be poor in service to the poor. Such boasts of our history as St. Elizabeth of Hungary, whose feast day we just celebrated yesterday, St. Francis of Rome, St. Margaret of Scotland, and the most famous of them all, and patron saint of my own city, St. Francis of Assisi. The Catholic Church to this day is the largest private provider of social services in the world. In our own country, our church is the largest private provider of health care and the only private provider of, of our size with an explicit commitment to providing health care for the poor. This is the civilization, the Christian civilization built by the church founded by Jesus Christ. Or better yet, the civilization that the church rebuilt after the fall of Rome, but rebuilt in a Christian way. And on the day that those who sought to cancel him out thought they had succeeded, we see God's blueprint, blueprint for this plan. St. John tells us in his gospel that when Jesus was crucified, he says, Pilate had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Here it is, the blueprint. The essence of the plan of Western civilization, of the church that would build a Christian civilization. It begins with God's original chosen people. God gave them the law, the Torah, through Moses. Now when we think of law, we think of rules and regulations to ensure good order and to defend rights, at least theoretically that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> uh, but that's not the idea of law in the biblical mentality. Law is revelation. God is revealing his truth to his people. And so 
The chosen, original chosen people of Israel were the first ones privileged with this revelation. And from this people, the church was born, to whom God gave the fullness of revelation in his son, Jesus Christ. As the church began to fulfill the Great Commission and proclaim the gospel throughout the known world of the time, she came more and more into contact with Greek culture. As you may know, Greek thought and the Greek language were the predominant cultural influence in the world of the, of the time. Even though it was the time of the Roman Empire, it was really Greek thought and culture that predominated. Much like we could say the English language and American culture are in the world of our own time. So this is the next step in building from that blueprint. The Greeks being the great philosophers that they were, the early church fathers understood how to translate Semitic thought into categories of Greek philosophy in order to bring the Gentiles to salvation in Christ. Then when Rome became Christian, the church was able to avail herself of the physical and social infrastructure of the Roman Empire that had spread all throughout Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Thus the third stop, the roads and laws and governing models of the Roman Empire or what gave the church the infrastructure she needed to build a common Christian community all throughout the world. And also, obviously, we have the writings of the great church fathers of the West, Augustine and Ambrose and so forth, in that Latin language, which then became the common language of the Christian world. Now, where does all of this come together in our everyday experience as Catholics? Truth, beauty, and goodness, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. It comes together, traditionally speaking at least, in the Mass. There at the Mass we have the Bible, the Church's magisterium through her tradition, art, music, architecture, poetry, and poetry in motion in the form of ceremony. And we have Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. Notice how the Church has always been careful to preserve something of the previous official language of prayer in those rare occasions when that language was changed. So the first Christians were Jewish, we know, which meant that they prayed in Hebrew. But with the success of the evangelization of the Gentiles, the language of prayer changed quickly within that first generation to Greek. However, in her liturgy, the church held on to traces of her first language, as she does to this day. Amen, Alleluia, and Hosanna are Hebrew words. And when we sing the Sanctus in Latin, also the word Sabaoth is a Hebrew word. About 200 years later, when the church in Rome started to celebrate the Mass in Latin, the Christians there still retained some Greek words, as we know, right? Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, in addition to continuing to hold on to those Hebrew words. So we see the development and the roadmap back to our origins. It is thus that the Mass encapsulates all of Western civilization. It is the distilled essence of that civilization of which it was the prime force in building. It brings to bet together truth, beauty, and goodness all in one place. Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. These are the building blocks of a great Christian civilization. And we have all of the elements of Western civilization at the mass. The distilled essence of that civilization represented by the sign Pilate had placed at the top of the cross. However, to see the most distilled essence of all, what truly is at the heart of it all, and must be at the heart of Catholic life in all of its forms, institutional, parish, family life, and so forth, we must look below the inscription. If we fail to do that, it will all be simply a facade. Pilate said, Behold your king. We need to gaze upon Christ on the cross and truly behold our King, the one who gave everything for us, even though he had no need to receive anything from us. Jesus himself, not only his teaching, but he, in his death on the cross, is the blueprint for a civilization of truth and love, a civilization imbued with a Christian ethos. The drive to counsel this out then ultimately is the attempt to cancel out the founder of the church, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This really, though, is nothing more than the old and ugly tendency towards sin, a tendency that affects all of us 
in our human weakness. All of us in some way and to some extent are with the crowds in the story. Instead of beholding our king, we claim we have no king but Caesar. It is our sins that with the crowd shout out, crucify him. No, there is nothing new about this. We are back in the Garden of Eden at the time of the fall. It is the attempt to counsel out God in order to do things our own way. There is, though, one cancel culture that our Lord did come to establish, canceling out sin. He has done that on the cross, paying the debt we owe to God, but which we could not pay ourselves. Since it was man who incurred the debt, man had to pay it back. So that is the one thing we might say the second person of the Most Holy Trinity did need to receive from us, a human nature, so that as man, he could pay back what we could not without his divine nature. But he only needed this because he condescended to come to our rescue, not because he stood to get anything out of it. That is the good news. And the pattern for how the human person lives in accordance with the original human dignity that God gave us, this self-sacrificial altruistic love, looking always for the good of the other. But someone needs to tell this to the world, to open deaf ears and break through the cacophony of postmodern cancel culture, so the message can get through and penetrate hearts and take root there. If not us, then who? It takes committed, faithful, and knowledgeable Catholics to bear witness to this good news in order to lead others there. Especially urgent is the need to accompany young people on this journey who are so deeply immersed in cancel culture, to accompany them in journeying from darkness to light, from sin to grace, from self-centered indulgence to altruistic love, after the pattern of our Savior on his cross. But we can only do that if we have gone there first ourselves. I want to thank you all for doing that. Through Catholic Radio, you're supporting the work of getting this message out, reaching people where they are at with this saving good news. Thank you for your support. Thank you for also your engagement in the world of sports. I know Bishop Abraki is very active in that area. That's a beautiful way to meet people where they're at, right? In some, in some places, sports the new religion. <laughs> so we meet them there. And we, we bring the saving good news where they're at to bring them to this life in Christ and rebuild a civilization, Christian civilization. So this is truly good news. And it's good news not just because of what we, we receive, but also because of the lesson it teaches us about how we are to live together well. Which, once again, comes not from looking at what one gets out of it, but rather looking to the good of the other before oneself. And only our Savior makes that possible. It is good that we behold our King on the cross, and it is good, too, to see in the inscription above him his plan for our living in a world in which his truth, beauty, and goodness can thrive. All of this comes together in the Holy Mass and is made present there. The greatest gift of all, though, is his presence there. He comes to meet us in every Mass to bring us his truth and love. This is the civilization that leads all into the true and lasting happiness with him that he came to win for us, a civilization born from the heart of his bride, the church. Let us strive to make our own contribution to this civilization in our families, our parishes, and all of the communities in which we interact, to be a beacon of truth, beauty, and goodness to a world weakened by error, evil, and sin, to be a community of faith, hope, and charity, so that all may grow more perfectly into the image and likeness in which God originally created us. In thanking you for your own commitment to living out this call of our Catholic faith, I pray that he may continue to bless you and give you access to the work of your hand, give success to the work of your hands for your own spiritual growth and that of your loved ones and fellow believers, that you may flourish here in this life and perfectly forever in heaven. May God grant us this grace. Amen.
Thank you, Archbishop Cordelione and Bishop Paprocki. After the Bears lose a game, I have to go to confession. <laughs> then I can receive communion from Monsignor Dempsey. He is here to give us the closing prayer. Patrick McCaskey is a parishioner at St. Patrick's Parish. He's also very faithfully present every morning, 8 o'clock at Mass, and always receives communion. And he is also one of our lectors, most faithfully and very, 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 very good quality. So we appreciate all of that. We're also grateful, of course, for Archbishop Corleone. Uh, <clears throat> Don Salvatore and I were in the seminary together at North American College, and then we lived for many years together at Villa Stritch when we were both laboring in the Vatican salt mines. But, and I had the, had the pleasure of uh, attending his ordination, his Episcopal ordination in San Diego, his installation in uh, Oakland, and then his installation in San Francisco. Uh, when, on behalf of the board, when we were talking with him about trying to arrange when he could come here to receive the reward, this award, he was really very, very accommodating and adjusting his schedule and made every effort to be with us this evening. So we're very, very grateful for everything he did. So as we prepare for Thanksgiving this coming week, we turn in prayer to God our Father to give thanks. We give thanks for the great leadership in your church shown by Archbishop Cordelione, Bishop Paprocki, all those ordained to lead and serve your church, we give you thanks for the wonderful evangelization mission of WSFI Radio, and particularly for all those lay people who've taken up the call of Christ and exercise their prophetic ministry, their prophetic mission in the church in virtue of their baptism and confirmation. We're grateful for the many donors and supporters of WSFI and its apostolate, and we ask their continued support and your continued blessing on them. We give you thanks for the wonderful meal that we have shared together, the inspiring words that we have heard, and for those who work so hard to prepare this event, to prepare our food, and to serve it. And as we approach Thanksgiving Day, we ask you to keep us ever mindful of those who depend on our generosity for their daily bread. So we give thee thanks, almighty God, for these and all thy benefits, who livest and reignest, world without end, amen. And in this month of November, we pray, Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of all the faithfully departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a pleasant evening and a safe trip home. God bless you and thank you. Thank you for listening. This is better than talking to myself. <laughs> uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, Jesus said eternal life is a banquet. Thanks to Matt and Angela Tomlinson, the honeymooners, this banquet has been a preview of heaven. Have a Hall of Fame night.